Okay, thank you, Pasquale. Uh, Rusty Pro, be you. Okay, thanks. So thanks to the organizers for inviting me to discuss this paper, which I found very interesting. Okay, sorry. Okay, so the, ba the main thing that this paper is trying to do is try to understand the effects of automation on productivity and labor demand in an economy where low-skill labor is being substituted by intermediate goods. So that's the main thing here, and that's different from the traditional literature on automation, which has been thinking about substitution by capital. Now, I think that this is a useful and valid point, because when you think about the production of many automated tasks, it requires the use of services of specialized robots, software, and machines. And as Safer pointed out, the delivery of these services often involves very complex and long supply chains with many variable inputs. So when we are thinking about using a robot in a US factory, that robot was produced in Japan by a factory where actually robots are making robots. The robots are then shipped to the US. They are installed and programmed by integrators. The recur recurrent expenditures on integrators, which have to reprogram the robots, refurbish them, maintain them, and replace them, accounts for about 75% of the value of a robotic system. So at the end of the day, this thing that we're calling capital is not just a pure capital good, it's a mixture of some services or intermediate goods and pure capital goods, right? So in this paper, what Safer and Matt are doing is that they are taking this into account and they are thinking about introducing the supply chains of the goods that are substituting for labor and taking that point seriously and not just thinking in terms of substitution by capital. So in this discussion, what I want to do is think about this distinction between capital and intermediates. I'm going to argue that for most of the results in the paper, actually, this distinction is not super important. But I will also conclude by pointing out to two areas where I think that this distinction is crucial and we need to understand it better. In particular, this distinction between capital or intermediates is going to be very important if we want to think about the distributive implications of automation. So distribution of income, because capital income tends to be more concentrated on the top that labor income. And also you want to think about the propagation of shocks. So one of the unintended consequences of all of these automation businesses is, for instance, that we are now exposed to shocks to the metallurgic industry in Japan, right? So that's something interesting that we want to make, uh, think about. So let me start by introducing a simple version of the model. So this is how I understand the model. So you have production process that uses labor, low-skill labor L in different tasks and high-skill labor H, and the alphas and the betas are the importance of these tasks in the production of value added. Okay, and imagine that we have a task zero where we have an alternative way of producing this task using a supply chain that delivers an intermediate that can substitute for low-skill labor in that particular task. Now, that's, that supply chain is going to have a productivity AR and it's going to use some low-skill labor in its production, but it's also going to use mostly high-skill labor in the production of those goods that can substitute for labor. Now, what happens when that supply chain becomes very productive, when the AR starts growing? Well, at some point, you're going to move from the production function at the top to the production function at the bottom. So what's new? Well, at the bottom, low-skill labor is doing fewer tasks than before, High-skill labor is much more important in the production of value added. The economy is becoming more interconnected because instead of relying on low-skill labor, we rely on the supply chain to produce. And the point of the paper is to try to introduce what are the implications for productivity and labor demand of this kind of transformation. Now, let me compare this to the usual automation framework that David, Daron, and many others have introduced. So in this framework, we have capital as well. So we have some tasks produced by capital. And here we are thinking that task zero is no longer substituted by an intermediate, but is substituted by a capital good. Equipment, software, an algorithm, and so on, right? And as this substitution takes place, we go from the production function at the top to the production function at the bottom, where capital is now producing more tasks and low-skill labor is producing fewer tasks. So in some sense, when you think about capital, capital is just some fixed cost that we incurred in the past to be able to use the robots today. In some sense, what's happening here is that the economy is also becoming more interconnected, but it's more interconnected over time, not necessarily over space. And the second thing is that the economy is also becoming more roundabout, because capital is produced from final goods today. 
So in some sense, there's a flavor of the things that you guys are mentioning also here in this simple model. Now let's discuss the implications of these kinds of transformations for productivity and labor demand. So let's start with productivity. When is the transformation going to happen? Well, the transformation is going to happen when prices tell you that it should happen. So in particular, when the cost of producing this task with low-skilled labor, which is the wage of low-skilled workers divided by their productivity in this task, AL0, is greater than the cost of producing the task with the alternative technology, which is the cost of the labor or the capital using the technology, WR, divided by the productivity of the technology. So at that point, you're going to shift to the second production function. Now, what are the pro implications for productivity of that shift? Well, you can actually show that the increase in TFP after the transformation is always given by this very nice formula. Is the share of the task that is being automated times the percent decline in the cost of producing that task when you shift to the alternative production process. And this makes intuitive sense because the productivity gains are coming here because we are being able to substitute an expensive input for a cheaper one. So it's the difference in cost that determines the productivity. Now, this equation is quite general and it does not rely on the view of capital as an intermediate of capital as a capital good. It's quite general. It's actually like a corollary of Holton's theorem. So let me actually use this equation to make two points. The first point is something that Safer made repeatedly, that is that automation may not lead to big productivity gains. You can see that from this equation. So like if I have substitution of labor in some tasks by robots or intermediates that are barely most cost effective than the workers that they're replacing, then the productivity effects are going to be quite small. So that's one point that you were making. The second point that I want to make is that if you look at this equation, the productivity gains are higher when the wage of low-skill workers is higher, right? And the wage of low-skill workers is telling us exactly something about their opportunity cost of time. So low-skill workers have a high wage when they are very scarce or there are many alternative uses for them. So that's the second result that Safer emphasized a lot. If we have many alternative uses for low-skill labor, their wages are going to be high, their opportunity cost of time is going to be high, and therefore, automating tasks where these workers are specialized is very profitable because we can redeploy these workers to many of these alternative uses. So you can see that this insight is quite general. It's an insight that it's also there in the traditional automation literature and does not depend on this business of whether we think of capital as pure capital or as intermediates. Now let's turn to wages. What about wages? In this simple Cobb Douglas formulation that I introduced, wages are just the share of tasks done by low skilled workers times output per worker. Now, this transformation of the economy is going to have two effects on wages. On the one hand, I'm taking some tasks away from low skilled labor. That's a displacement effect, which I've already explained. But we also get increases in productivity because we get to substitute expensive labor for machinery, right? So the effect is ambiguous. It depends on how this displacement effect weights against the productivity effect. And you also get the insight that because I already told you that the productivity gains are larger when the wage of the displaced factor is higher, if low-skilled workers have a higher opportunity cost of time, then their wages are going to go up. So the kind of automation that is bad for wages is when you're automating a factor that has a very low opportunity cost of time with very mediocre technologies. That's the kind of automation that is going to reduce wages. Now, there's another insight here, which I think it's interesting, that once the substitution phase is done, we get no more displacement. The red term disappears because you're no longer sure changing the allocation of tasks. At this point, this is something that Daron and I have called a deepening of automation. Further improvements in machinery or intermediates are not going to reduce wages. They're only going to increase productivity. So this is also something that you guys mentioned. You call it the state dependency of productivity gains. So this is just to say that there are lots of parallels between the insights in this paper and the insights in the traditional automation literature that I think are quite general and that are captured by these equations that I just showed you. So now let me conclude by talking about two points where I think that this distinction between capital and intermediate goods is actually much more important and much more interesting. So the first thing are the distributional consequences of automation. So let's imagine that 
Automation is really about the substitution of labor for capital goods. So capital goods are fixed costs that we incur in the past in order to use them today, right? But someone uses, someone is the owner of those assets that we produce in the past. Now, if automation is about this kind of substitution, then that's important because automation is gonna increase the importance of capital income in the economy. And some of the productivity gains from automation can accrue to capital owners in the form of higher capital incomes. Now, why, this is, why is this interesting? Because capital income, the distribution of capital income is much more concentrated at the top than the distribution of labor income, right? So this is gonna have distributional consequences that are very different from those that you would expect in a world where automation is about the substitution of low-skilled workers for a combination of high-skilled labor and low-skilled workers. In that second world, automation can affect inequality, but only through wages, because automation is not increasing the importance of capital income. It's just reshuffling the way in which we produce tasks, changing it between a production chain that uses only low-skilled labor to a production chain that uses a mixture of low-skilled labor and high-skilled labor. So the implications of, for distributions and income distributions of these two types of models are quite different. So if you want to think about automation as something that could perhaps be behind the recent rise in wealth inequality, then you should think about the first kind of model. The second model is going to be mostly silent about those kinds of dynamics. The second area where I think that this distinction is quite important has to do with interconnectedness and propagation of shocks. So I already gave you an example, just because we are relying on these longer supply chains, we are now exposed to shocks to Japan or to Germany or to the metallurgic industry in many countries. You also gave an excellent example about electricity and self-driving cars and so on. So like I think that this is something that, like I think came a little bit at the end of the paper, but like I think that should be the center of the paper because I think that here is where the new insights are coming. In particular, I would like to learn more about whether this exposure to shocks is somehow counteracted by the greater ability to substitute that technology is also bringing into the system. So those are all my comments. Thank you. Okay, comments or questions? consequences of that because thinking of the discussion you know you get the sense that the returns to capital are going higher we'd expect owners of capital to have more but it actually may be more concentrated than that it may be that it gets concentrated in the people who are controlling the automation and if you could say something about that yeah it's it's a great question is uh, so in the model we have this uh, perfectly competitive economy then uh, but of course, if we consider like imperfect competition and like the entry and exit uh, to automation sector, then it might have different uh, and uh, like other insights. Uh, yes, it's mainly like. But in uh, the main thing that the automation uh, role in this uh, production process is that it transforms the economy through the supply chains, and so basically, what makes aut today's automation different might be hidden in the uh, differences in production processes and the production networks. So, uh, and in your case, there will be the, those effects over the production networks, but uh, there will be some additional channels there as well. Uh, yes. David? Yeah, uh, just one more modeling choice seems really central, which is that you only allowed automation to substitute for kind of low skill work. And, you know, I think that was a good assumption for some time ago, but you know, sort of in the realm in which we're in now, it seems that seems less and less viable. And, you know, I would think you would want to think more continuously. And, you know, the incentives for automation are, are high for high wage work, as your, you know, model makes clear. And, of course, that would tend to be at the top of the skill distribution. And it'd be interesting to think about how that changes over time and what would be the, you know, that could actually have more positive implications for productivity uh, in your story, especially if there's, you know, Good outside opportunities, which we think there are. So that would that could change the flavor of the results somewhat. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this comment. And so basically, our intuition is like having a simple model to explain the income inequality and 
uh, where there are like routine tasks, non-routine tasks, and like uh, in some tasks, labor can be substituted, so we can call it differently, and in other tasks, labor cannot be substituted yet. But if we consider like the uh, automation uh, and how it affects the all types of labor and the substitution, so we will have like, as you said, like different productivity gains. But uh, so the main uh, modeling choice was about this uh, income inequality, uh, especially for that part uh, of the model. But thank you, that's a very important point. Yes, please. Yeah. Oh, just pass the mic here, Antoine. So this is a little bit of a technical question. You used all Cobb Douglas production functions, and in production networks, that carries uh, some pretty stark implications, like uh, shares will always be constant for all factors. Uh, how would your results generalize for non-unitary elasticities? Uh, excellent question. So, uh, so we have the traditional Cobb Douglas with one difference where there is this perfect substitutability of inputs in some tasks. So when we uh, consider like decreasing returns to scale or increasing returns to scale, uh, so the, the, Obviously, like again, with the imperfect competition, there will be some uh, different implications, but we thought for the uh, the results that we are interested in, like the uh, aggregate welfare and income inequality results, basically, and how production networks, uh, like the technological changes in production networks translates into changes in other sectors. So uh, following the, like, the uh, literature in the macroeconomic, uh, the, like the interconnectedness and their macroeconomic impacts, we again use this Cobb Douglas form with like this difference of the substitutability, but it will have some uh, further implications with other cases. Yeah. Joshua? So, with the distinction between is automation coming from uh, a capital good? Uh, versus an intermediate good. It seems to me that that setup uh, would allow you to exploit uh, differences in the tradability of automation. So if it's a capital good, I'm sitting there with my production process thinking about where I can automate it, which you know gives me some flexibility of how I rejig workers for it. With an intermediate good, the idea, at least the way it sort of crops up there and the way you do the prices is that is traded. So some other firm does it and it trades it. And so along with that uh, comes different implications for how you might use labour with that intermediate good. And uh, I suspect that that would have an impact if you could sort of drive a wedge. And that's related to Greg's comment on market power as well. But just thinking about the organisational economics of this uh, might be interesting as well. So if I understand correctly, so you're uh, mentioning the difference between uh, automation being capital and intermediate good is important in terms of like how labor is used in that process. Well, just in terms of how you'd organize production. Um, you know, so my potted view of it is like, if I build my own capital good, I have the, the maintenance people on staff and the people who understand how to deal with it and integrate it in and fit other things in. If I'm gonna procure an intermediate good, especially if I'm, desiring to substitute for a workforce, that intermediate good kind of has to operate more independently. Um, and that sort of suggests a sort of different way of shaping the production process as a result of that. So I just, uh, I, you know, that's maybe beyond the scope of the paper, but it strikes me that that is kind of interesting because it also decouples us not only within the boundaries of the firm, but also across space in terms of, you know, where's the automation occurring? Um, am I building an entirely new factory or am I substituting things on a task-by-task -task basis in the current one? Yeah, so great, great comments. Uh, and uh, and yet related with that, yesterday I heard there was a discussion about, like, where this automation, uh, like, what is the most important question for the next 10 years? And uh, as Joshua also mentioned, so it is one of the most important things where it will evolve. So where it will evolve will depend on the, the productivity increases in uh, different possible like dimensions that automation can touch. And uh, yes, so the, 
having labor in the production process uh, in automation changes the things and and as you said like the differences also <laughs> would come from how it will transform the production processes as a capital or, or as an intermediate good but we see like automation goods as intermediate goods such as industrial robots like used in the production lines or uh, softwares that uh, replace some clerical workers used again in the production lines but uh, the, uh, basically uh, with some differences among those but uh, mainly as an intermediate good uh, this replacement is happening and that's our approach. Okay, last question. Uh, Avi and Anna, you can uh, come up and just get set up for your uh, next presentation. Okay. Um, so I want to reemphasize Pasquale's last comment on this, um, how to think about the propagation of shocks and when it might be mitigated. And then I'm curious, with that, combine it with David's suggestion on thinking through high and low skilled labor. So how would, how would you think about uh, differences in high and low skilled labor and this propagation of shocks and when it may matter and when it won't? So propagation of shocks, what happens in the model is that when uh, these shocks happen, depends on the shock, it might result in automation or not. So when it results in automation, then the production network becomes denser and like sectors become much more interconnected. And on the other hand, when this interconnectedness increase, and which means that labor, like a uh, low skilled labor type is replaced by a product produced by L uh, and H types and also other intermediates. So it means that it favors more the high skilled labor type. And so therefore we have this, uh, like all general equilibrium effects together, which is like increased interconnectedness and increased income inequality. But when we consider like there are, uh, so in some, so some tasks uh, like high-skilled labor uh, will be replaced. So this is again, turns out to be the definition. So what we refer there is the non-routine versus routine tasks and or non-automatable versus automatable tasks. And, but that's a great comment and uh, very important for the future implications. Yeah. Great. Okay, thank you.